Hello friends, welcome to part two of the Ascension of Isaiah. We're going to be reading chapters three through six today. And man, oh man, are there some interesting things in chapters three through six of the Ascension of Isaiah. A bit like the Apocalypse of Abraham, I Definitely, after pre-reading this before bringing it to you guys, I definitely see why um, the evil powers that be wanted to ban this book. They just gave away way too much. Um, and for those of us who are awake and know what's going on in the world, it's pretty obvious what Isaiah was talking about in this missing book. As always, most of you know, this is a recap from our Tuesday uh, live videos on the Dark Outpost from 1 to 3 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. If you wanna be a participant in that conversation on Tuesdays, then there is a link down in the description box where you can jump on to the Dark Outpost platform. We are also covering on that platform um, Michael and Debbie Pearl in the second hour we've been reading through To Train Up a Child, which unfortunately is not something I can cover on this channel just because of the nature of the content. It would definitely cause some problems because there's a lot of A-B-U-S-E in that book. All right, before we get started, there's something that I want to talk about that I really don't want to have to talk about, but I try to avoid having to talk about these things because my interest in moving forward in this Great Awakening and this new timeline, this age of Aquarius, is that we, at this point, those of us who are on this channel, we absolutely understand now what has happened, what has gone on, and we've gone through that period of mourning. And now we are allowing the good guys, the military good guys, to go and do what they need to do to bring vindication and justice to all of those that have um, been extremely hurt by the, um, the elite, the powers that be. I have to be careful about what I say because of censorship, but I think most of you guys know what I'm talking about. I'm not someone that wants to sit on my channel and like bash other truthers. I really have a profound respect for everybody in this community because we are all working together. In my opinion, that's what I have believed this whole time, is that we are all working together to help each other move forward and understand um, who we really are and what the truth of who we really are is. And through that, through that understanding that we have a, a more um, intact and purposeful relationship with God. Now, as I've said on the Dark Outpost and on this channel, I'm good with God. I love God. I have a very, very fulfilling relationship with God. Because I'm firm in my relationship with God, all of these missing our banned books, all this new information that's coming up with the Jesus Strand, with stuff that has been manipulated, to me is just super, super fascinating. It doesn't change anything about the way I view God because my belief in God isn't conditional on what the church taught me. My belief and relationship with God comes through my own experiences with God. And so for me, it's a very positive thing that we get to unravel some of these lies and that together we get to understand what the true story is. And and it, it, it's, it's deepened my relationship with the divine. It hasn't shaken anything. It hasn't taken anything away from me because again, as I said, I'm good with God. And I think God is good with me too. I feel very protected and very blessed by God. I feel a lot of love and a lot of joy from God. And again, part of this channel is to be able to spread that love and that joy and to uncover things, but also have humor and community with each other. I don't really consider you guys just to be like subscribers to my channel. I consider you guys to be like on the battlefield with me. You are standing beside me as we try to correct, as we try to course correct everything that has been done. I understand that the fact that I practice yoga and my boyfriend and I run a yoga business is very triggering to a lot of fundamentalist Christians. I understand that because I love tarot card readings and all that kind of stuff and I am learning gematria that that's very triggering for fundamentalist Christians. But it is my opinion that fundamentalist Christianity is satanic. It's evil. 
And it's part of the problem, along with the Catholic Church, along with all the Protestant churches. I know a lot of truthers do believe that the Catholic Church and all the little churches beneath it are the Whore of Babylon, mentioned in Revelation, and I, I, I agree. In my opinion, I, I believe that that is true. With that being said, I know things are not black and white, that there are many people within these congregations that are really good people, as Liz and I spoke about, as David and I have spoken about, who have been completely brainwashed. And my heart and my empathy and my compassion go out to them as they start to realize that everything they've been taught in their fundamentalist churches is satanic and is not of God. That every law and boundary they place on themselves through this faith is one that is meant to hurt people and control people and not free people. Which, in my opinion, God and Jesus are very, very free. With that being said, I understand that there are people out there that I've worked with in the past and that I've had nothing but respect for in the past that are out there saying some very def um, defamatory things regarding those of us working on the Jesus Strand, uh, Jesus Strand and those of us working with Gematria and tarot cards and all that kind of stuff. And my heart goes out to those people because I do believe that they are very heavily brainwashed and they're working from a place of fear, and that's not where God lives. That's where Satan lives. And so with that being said, I stand in my faith. I am good with God, and I feel very, very comfortable with everything I am working on and with all the people that I am working with. I love them as human beings. They are wonderful, wonderful people. And so my response to that is, is that in my opinion, when you get on a show and you start calling other truthers, or you start saying what other truthers are doing is demonic, that's defamatory. And that's coming from a place of hate and coming up from a place of Satan, not of God. And so I've had to cancel some um, shows that I was going to go on, but um, I've had to step back because I have to um, protect myself and protect those that I love and care about, being all the people that I've worked with on the Jesus Strand with. I consider all the people that I've worked with on the Jesus Strand with and I continue to work with. Those are my friends now. We talk a lot and we're working on other projects together and I'm so incredibly, I feel just so blessed to have Sabrina Gal in my life and Toronto in my life and Negative 48 in my life, Tom Numbers in my life, Liz from TikTok in my life, David Zublik, Tarot by Janine, Tamara, Prime Minister who has turned into like a brother to me. God, I love Prime Minister so, so, so much. Uh, Christy from YouTube, all these incredible people, all these people, I'm probably forgetting someone if I am, I apologize, all these people that I've mentioned, I consider them now, like a lot of you, I consider a lot of you my friends now, I consider them my friends as well. And Sabrina Gal in Toronto are two women that I speak to now almost on a daily basis basis. I feel like they're my girlfriends, you know, and, and, and I feel just so blessed by God that these women came into my life because they're supposed to be in my life. I'm going to get emotional talking about this. It's the same thing with yoga. Yoga is not demonic. And in fact, all of the things that I've heard people say when they're arguing that it is demonic are all topics that they bring up that aren't even taught in yoga. It's not even a part of yoga. So I know when they say that they're spewing propaganda, which is dishonesty, which is lies, and God tells us not to lie, and they're lying. So I don't know if they're aware that they're doing that or if they're just promoting the fear, but there's that. And I get emotional because I know for a fact, I had a very spiritual experience, that God is who brought me to India. And everything that's happened because of yoga has been such a profound and powerful, positively powerful part of my life. Through yoga, I met my boyfriend, who I consider to be my husband, even though we're not married by the federal government. We don't have the cabal involved in our marriage. We are married in the eyes of God, is what I believe. We are committed to each other like a married couple. It's allowed me to bring 
dogs back. I've rescued six dogs from India. One of the dogs that we have here, our dog Ravi, is just the love of my life. I love my dog so much. I see God in his eyes. It's allowed me to do humanitarian work in the slums of India and get firsthand experience of what happens to people in those poverty-based situations, poverty like most of us in the West will never see and have never seen. And as my mama used to tell us growing up, to whom much is given, much is expected. And I believe God brought that into my life. I also believe that it's pretty evil to sit there as a human being and condemn other people because they have different opinions from you and they're going on their own journey. No human being is, is more righteous than the other. No human being is in the position to be able to condemn another person because of their life choices. As Jesus said, ye who is without sin may cast the first stone. Also, as Jesus said, as prime minister has brought up, Jesus said, if they are not against me, then they are for me. Janine, my friend Janine, a tarot card reader, brought up a beautiful story on the Dark Outpost about how she saw Jesus. Jesus came to her in her room too, and she's a tarot card reader. This hate, this division that's coming from a very satanic fundamental place has got to stop. It's okay if you have a different opinion as somebody else, but what is not okay is when you start to condemn that person and defame that person's character because your beliefs have been challenged or triggered. When your beliefs are triggered, that's not anybody else's responsibility, but yours to work out and figure out why. Now, because I'm having to address this on this video, I am going to be disabling the comments. And I hate to do that. I absolutely hate to disable the comments. The only times I ever disable the comments is if I'm worried because the guest and I have spoken about something that's pretty potent and we want to keep the algorithms down for the powers that be on this platform to not notice, if y'all know what I'm saying. And today I'm going to take disable the comments down because the last week I have been so attacked because of the words of one supposed whistleblower in this community. And that is not okay. I have watched people come in on my channel and attack other people in the comment section because they are spewing love for the things that we're doing on this channel and so people come in and attack that person and try to condemn that person and condemn me and that is not acceptable and moving forward past this video again if you want to have a healthy conversation in the comments expressing opinions in a respectful way that's totally fine i encourage that that's critical thinking skills that's how we evolve and how we learn but if you come on this channel and you try to condemn somebody's soul because they don't believe what you believe, then you will be blocked. No questions asked. You will be booted from this channel. I will not tolerate that. God did not step down and make you the holder, the keeper of everybody else's soul. Everybody else's relationship with God is a private, personal matter. I don't want to be involved in anybody else's relationship with God because that is your sacred relationship with your creator. You are anointed. You are special in his eyes. In me, I should not be involved with that. Same goes for other people coming into my relationship with God. It's none of your business. I'm good with God. In this whole great awakening, we all have one common enemy. And these are people who are hurting other people. None of us are out there hurting other people the way that this elite group have done. They are the enemy, not each other. And if there are truthers out there that are trying to cause division amongst our community instead of unity, we can be unified even if we believe different things, which is how I have moved this channel forward. I know that there are people out there that have different opinions than I do, but I still do shows with them because that's what makes the world great. But when those people start to attack other people or send people out there to attack them, I start to question whether those people are actually on the side of light or of darkness. 
Anyway, sorry to vent. Again, I will have no comments on this video because I just, I, I can't take it at this moment. Other videos moving forward will have the comments, but this is a warning. And, and I hate to even bring this up, honestly, because 99.9% .9 of the people on this channel are the most lovely, beautiful, kind, gorgeous souls that I have the privilege of communicating with in the comic section. And I am so wonderfully grateful to all of you, you know who you are, who leave positive, beautiful comments, not just for me, but for the guests that I bring on this show as well. You people that leave those beautiful, beautiful comments, you are the salt of the earth. You are the reason why humanity is good. For those that come on this channel and want to condemn other people's soul, you are the one that has the problem, not the person you are condemning. Anyway, I'm sorry. I'm sorry to get kind of heated about that, but it's it's really made me very emotional. I feel very protective of the work we do on this channel, and I don't just consider it me doing the work. You, the, you guys who listen to these podcasts and these videos, you are a part of this work as well. And normally, when I read from the missing books of the Bible, I love to go and see what you guys have to say because so many times you guys have brought something to my attention that I missed when I was reading through these books and I am grateful for that. This is a group effort. I might be the one researching, I might be the one narrating it, but you are involved as well. We are, I say this in the comment section all the time to people and I mean it, we are in this together. We're doing this project with the missing books of the Bible together. It's not just me doing it, it's not just David Zubluck doing it with me, it's you guys as well. You are so much a part of this. And that's why I hate having to turn the comment section off on this one video, but it's just necessary for this video because I feel Feel like the dark beings have now waged war on us through other quote-unquote truthers in this community and that's just my opinion and so I want to put that boundary up now with that being said for my beautiful subscribers the 99.9% .9 of you who are lovely lovely wonderful people I will put something on the community tab where you can leave your comments there um, so that we can have another discussion off of this video because I just don't want to attract any of the um, defectors that are trying to like take us down um, to this video with that being said another note I want to bring up with these people, these truthers that are defaming us out there that because we're going through the missing books of the Bible or we're looking into the Jesus strand, here's the thing, and this is just common sense. We got to this place, we got to where we are involving the 1%, the elite, the black hats, because we stopped critically thinking. And because we stopped looking at things for ourselves, we got to this place of complacency where, you know, the leaders of the church or the leaders of the educational programs, the universities, at the, the, the medical facilities, where we just took people's word for it. That in itself is a form of spellcasting. And the fact that there are truthers that claim to be truthers, that claim to be whistleblowers, that claim to be all these things, that say that it's like demonic for us to be reading these missing books of the Bible, um, it's not demonic to actually read anything. We're just reading through this material. And I've said this over and over and over again, and I know we've said this on David's channel as well, we're not telling you that you have to believe that these books are legitimate or not. We just want to see what they say. Because by us not wanting to see what they say is how we got into the position that we're in now and the battle that we're having to go through now. Moving forward into our new earth, into the new timeline, we can't let this crap happen again. We have to all be informed. We have to all do our own research and we all have to stand in our sovereignty and have our own opinions. So when somebody gets on YouTube or on any other platform and claims to be a truther and claims to be this and claims to be that, but tells you not to read the missing books of the Bible, then they got another thing coming because that's where we got lost to begin with. That's where it all got screwed up, is when we handed over our power to somebody else. We handed over our power to the officials at our church. We handed over our power to the professors at the universities. We handed over our power to the government. 
do not hand your power over. Your opinion on these books is your opinion, but your opinion can be very different from the action of reading the book. That's how you get an opinion is you actually look at the information. And I hope that makes sense. So again, moving forward, if anybody comments on these missing books of the Bible episodes that we're reading through that we're demonic because we're reading these books, you'll just get blocked. You'll get blocked. We're not going to have that happening on this channel. You can tell us in the comment section why you think this book is demonic and your reasoning can't be because so-and-so said so. I want you to give reasons, actual historical facts and information from the book itself to prove your case. Not because somebody else told you it was. I don't care what somebody else thinks. I care what you think. So, again, moving forward, I just really hope that when we move into the new age, we'll be able to drop all this fear and really stand in our own sovereignty and our own light. All right. Okay. Now that that's over, let's move on to part two of the Ascension of Isaiah. This is chapters three through six. And once again, before I even get to that, again, thank you so much to the 99.9% .9 of you who are just the loveliest people in the, in the whole world. I feel really, I get really emotional about you guys because you guys are so awesome. Sorry. Y'all are just such awesome people. And I want the 99.9% .9 of you to understand, even though we've never met in person, even though we only comment back and forth on the comment section. I want you to understand how much you have meant to me in my life. I get people messaging me all the time and commenting, thanking me for doing this, for reading through these missing books of the Bible and for having this platform. But honestly, the pleasure is mine because you bring so much to my life. And because of the people on this platform that leave such amazing, supportive comments and reading the comments that you guys when you guys communicate with each other even when I'm not involved in the conversation and I read those comments my heart is so touched by the kindness that you guys have towards each other too you are making a difference in this world even even if you don't know it even if you're just all you're doing is sitting at home and watching these videos and leaving comments here and there those comments those positive beautiful comments make such a difference and I want, I want you all to know that 99.9% .9 of you, that you are special and I am honored. I am so honored to have you on this platform. And I thank you for supporting this platform. And I thank you for being here with me on this journey. God bless you all. I pray for you all. I send love to you guys all every single day because where we go one, we go all. All right. All right, let me go clean my makeup up because I'm getting a little teary-eyed here and we'll get into the ascension of Isaiah. All right, so let's get started here on chapter three. So just a catch up now again, if this is your first time clicking on this video or this channel, welcome to the channel, but you might want to start with part one first so you know a little bit about the backstory of this book and the characters in this book and where we are in the story. Once more, a link to part one is down in the description box below. If you are on an iPhone or an iPad, you might have to hit the down arrow button that's right below the video screen in front of you. I know that on iPhone, sometimes the description box doesn't pop up like it does on a laptop or a desktop. So just know you have to actually click the button to see everything in the description box. And that's where, again, part one will be. You can just click on the button that links to part one so you can listen to that one first as well as all the other past episodes, the past books of the Bible that we have read on the Dark Outpost. The playlist is the Dark Outpost playlist because that is the platform where we are reading through these books live. All right, so again, chapters one and chapters two of the Ascension of Isaiah showed Isaiah speaking to King Hezekiah, who was the good king, about Isaiah's own future. And basically, Hezekiah's son, Manasseh, who when he would become king, because he's a prince now, when he would become king, he would be Isaiah's demise. He would be the one that would bring the kingdom of Judah back into the worship of Baal and Moloch, the satanic um, deities, Luciferianism. And um, he would be after anybody who pushed 
worship of the true God, the God of light, um, the almighty God. And Isaiah, being the prophet, same Isaiah from the book of Isaiah in the Bible, is also Manasseh's maternal grandfather. So Manasseh's mother is the daughter of the prophet Isaiah. So Manasseh is not only going to basically execute anybody who doesn't go along with his plan in this story, but he is also going to do this to his own flesh and blood. So there's that. All right. Now, where we are in the story, uh, Isaiah has had to go into the mountains outside of Bethlehem with other prophets to basically hide from Manasseh and from the army of, of, the, of the government, basically. And so that's where we are now. Now, we know in Bethlehem there were some people who aren't good guys, right, that they uh, really supported um, Manasseh, and so kind of a little foreshadowing as to what's going to happen. So here we are with chapter 3. And Belcheria recognized and saw the place of Isaiah and the prophets who were with them, for he dwelt in the region of Bethlehem and was an adherent of Manasseh. And he prophesied falsely in Jerusalem, and many belonging to, to Jerusalem were confederate with him, and he was a Samaritan. So I looked up Belcheria just to understand some of the uh, Jewish folklore that we find here in some of these missing books of the Bible that would have been in the Old Testament, where the ascension of Isaiah would have been in the Old Testament. And Belcheria basically just is is kind of the metaphor of a person who is like a middleman between humans and the underworld, if that makes sense. And it came to pass when Algar Zagar, king of Assyria, had come in, in captive and led them away to the mountains of the Medes in the river of Tazan. This Balcheria, whilst in a youth, had escaped and come to Jerusalem in the days of Hezekiah, king of Judah. But he walked not in the ways of his father of Samaria, for he feared Hezekiah. Of course he feared Hezekiah because he Hezekiah was a good king. And this Belcheria, along with Manasseh and some of the false prophets, are prophets of the underworld, the darkness. And he was found in the days of Hezekiah speaking words of lawlessness in Jerusalem. So lawlessness, I'm learning in a lot of these um, missing books of the Bible in the Old Testament. When they use the term lawlessness, it just means satanic stuff, basically. And I know that's weird because lawlessness could just typically mean like not following the law of, of, hum of the human world. But in these texts, it's pretty much meaning like He's following, lawlessness is like following satanic order. And the servants of Hezekiah accused him, and he made his escape to the region of Bethlehem, and they pursued. And Belteria accused Isaiah and the prophets who were with him, saying, Isaiah and those who are with him prophesy against Jerusalem and against the cities of Judah, that they shall be laid to waste against the children of Judah and Benjamin, also that they shall go into captivity and against thee, O Lord the King, that thou shalt go bound with hooks and with iron chains. So this is interesting. The first time I read this, this reminded me a lot of what we're seeing today in our own time, in our own time line with things like, you know, the media, um, giving us kind of a gaslit story or narrative of the truth, really twisting the story. And this is what Belcheria is doing to Isaiah. He's basically twisting the story and projecting what Manasseh is actually doing onto Isaiah and making Isaiah's prophet, the, prof the prophecies of Isaiah to be evil and scaring the people to then turn against Isaiah and these prophets. I hope that makes sense. And, and that is common in, throughout all these missing books of the Bible that we've covered. And I know you guys have mentioned this too. There's so many similarities between what are in these missing books in the Bible and what we're actually seeing in our modern times. And I've laughed and I've said, I, I guess this is why they banned these books, right? They don't want us to see this, this stuff. All right, so this brings us to verse 7. And they prophesy falsely against Isaiah and Judah. And Isaiah himself has said, I see more than Moses the prophet. Now, for me as a Gentile, not a, Jew, a person of Jewish descent, I am learning a lot about this because we saw this in the Gospel of the Holy Twelve where Jesus himself said, I am, I am, I can't remember exactly how he said it, but he said something like, is not a greater one than Moses here. You know, the laws of Moses, this was a huge prophet to the Hebrew people. And so now we've moved down the timeline from Moses and we're seeing these people like Isaiah, like Jesus himself, that 
have more knowledge than Moses, and it's kind of blasphemous, is if what if from what I'm reading in these books for a Jewish person to say that to his fellow, you know, people. Um, and that's interesting because I don't, as a Christian Gentile, growing up Christian Gentile, I, I, I would have never noticed that. So that's something super interesting. And if, if you are of um, Jewish lineage or heritage, I would love to know more about that. Like, is that something that's still spoken about in synagogues and in temples? Just let me know, uh, email me or Hopefully when we get the comments back up again, you can let me know as well because I'm super interested to learn more about that. I've been only to one, I went to one um, service, um, Shabbat maybe, I, I can't remember the proper terms with a friend once who was Jewish and that's the only time I've ever been to any type of um, of uh, what we would call church, but temple, synagogue. Uh, and it, it re reminded me a lot of church, like there's a lot of similarities be between that service anyway and like the services I had as a kid growing up in a church. So anyway, all right, so this brings us to verse nine. But Moses said, said, no man can see God and live. And Isaiah hath said, I have seen God and behold, I live. Now therefore, O king, that he is lying. And Jerusalem also he hath called Sodom. And the princes of Judah and Jerusalem he hath declared to be the people of Gomorrah. And he brought many accusations against Isaiah and the prophets before Manasseh. Now, we've talked a lot about Sodom in some of these missing books of the Bible from the Old Testament. And we're seeing a very different story regarding Sodom and Gomorrah than we were taught from the cabal-owned church growing up. Um, the Sodom and Gomorrah, the sexual activities that were happening there, according to these missing books of the Bible, were not, were not homosexual. It was crimes against children in that respect. That's all I can really say on YouTube. But we know what that is because if you're on this channel, you obviously understand exactly what happens in some of these rituals. And that's what was happening in Sodom and Gomorrah. So it gives a very different perspective on um, the reality of the battle that we're, fi we're fighting. So verse 11, but Belier dwelt in the heart of Manasseh and in the heart of the prince of Judah and Benjamin of and of the eunuchs and of the counselors of the king. So Belier again is another word for Satan. Satan has many names. It's pretty unbelievable how many names Satan actually has. And the words of Balchiria pleased him exceedingly, and he sent and seized Isaiah. For Belier was great wrath against Isaiah by reason of the vision, and because of the exposure wherewith he had exposed Samael, which is another word for Satan, and because through him the going forth of the beloved. So this is when we're going to get into the, uh, the um, prophecy that Isaiah that Isaiah, excuse me, the prophecy that Isaiah gave that's also in the Bible about the coming of Jesus. And if y'all remember from last week, we talked about how confusing the book of Isaiah can be to read. Um, some of his prophecies are pretty confusing. But something that Isaiah was really clear about was Jesus. A lot of, I guess at that time, a lot of these prophets had knew there was a coming of a, a savior, of a messiah. But I guess from what I understand, they, a lot of people thought it was going to be like an army, like a like God's army coming down on earth. But Isaiah was the only one to say that it was going to be one singular human being, one singular man. And throughout this work, Isaiah re recalls him and recalls this vision by calling Jesus the beloved, beloved with a capital B. And so basically, Belier Satan is angry that Isaiah saw the vision and exposed the vision of Jesus, and that was compromising Satan's power, right? So let's go ahead and start over again with verse 13. For Belier was great wrath against Isaiah by reason of this vision, and because of the exposure wherewith he had exposed Samael, and because through him the going forth of the beloved from the seventh heaven had been made known, and his transformation, his with a capital H, and his descent, and the likeness into which he should be transformed, that is, the likeness of man and the persecution wherewith he should be persecuted, and the torturers wherewith the children of Israel should torture him, and the coming of his disciples and the teachings, and that he should before the Sabbath be crucified upon the tree, and should be crucified together with the wicked men, and he shall be buried in the sepulchre. And those who were with him should be offended because of him, because of him, 
and watch of those who watch the sepulchre. So again, that's Jesus is going to come to, to earth. He's going to have all these disciples, these people that are going to change, literally change the trajectory of human consciousness. And he was going to be basically crucified for this, right? So verse 15, and the descents of the angel of the Christian church, which is in the heavens, he will summon in of the last days. And that Gabriel, the angel of the Holy Spirit, and Michael, the chief of the holy angels, in the third day will open the sepulchre, which we know that that happened in the Bible. And remember, guys, Isaiah lived, what, in the 700 BC? So he lived many, many hundreds of years before Jesus even came. So for him, he's prophesizing about things coming in the future. For us, this is the past. So it's interesting, you know, our favorite military back channel, 16 plus 1, always says future proves past. And that's something super interesting reading these missing books of the Bible is that, as I said just a few moments ago, knowing what we know now, we're able to read through these missing books of the Bible and go, ah, okay, I see, I see now. This is why they banned this book. It wasn't for our protection. They banned this book for their protection. These books exposed them. All right, so verse 17, speaking of 16 plus 1, And the beloved sitting on their shoulders will come forth and send out his disciples. And they will teach all the nations in every tongue of the resurrection of the beloved. And those who believe in his cross shall be saved in his, in his ascension into the seventh heaven whence he came. And again, I think I said this last week, and I'll say this again. I might repeat this multiple times, so I apologize if I do. There are a lot of similarities between the Ascension of Isaiah and the Apocalypse of Abraham, which we read a couple of books ago. A lot They talk a lot about seventh heaven, the different firmament layers, all that interesting, interesting stuff. All right. And many who believe in him will speak through the Holy Spirit, and many signs and wonders will be wrought in those days. And afterwards, on the eve of his approach, his disciples will forsake the teaching of the apostles and their faith and their love and their purity. So we actually saw that in the um, Gospel of Judas, if y'all remember. The Gospel of Judas was basically a gospel written, a political piece, written about the coming infiltration of the Christian church churches. That these disciples, which were the ones that basically had to leave, they were fugitives, so they had to come out of um, Israel and spread the gospel, that um, their descendants, hundreds and hundreds of years after them, would end up being corrupted, which is where we are now, right? Like, the Christian church is extremely dirty, right? It's not really a church of God. We know that the Christian church was infiltrated by Satanists, so they even turned Jesus into a satanic god. Um, if you don't know what I'm referring to, Go back and last, listen to the videos on Constantine and what they did um, to kind of very much corrupt this Jesus, that that the real Jesus. And yeah, so anyway, so let's go on to verse 22. And there will be much contention on the eve of his advent and his approach. And in those days, many will love office, though devoid of wisdom. So we're talking about the coming days with the Antichrist, which is interesting because once again, they're basically telling us, future proves past, we, we're seeing this right now. And there will be many lawless elders and shepherds dealing wrongly by their own sheep, and they will ravage them, owning to their not having holy shepherds. And many will change the honor of the garments of the saints for the garments of the covetous, and there will be much respect of persons in those days and lovers of the honor of this world." And there will be much slander and vain glory at the approach of the Lord, and the Holy Spirit with, will withdraw from many. And there will not be in those days many prophets, nor those who speak trustworthy words, save one here and there in dire places. On account of the spirit of error and fornication and of vainglory and of covetedness, which shall be in those who will be called servants of that one and those who will receive that one." And there will be great hatred in the shepherds and the elders towards each other. For there will be great jealousy in the last days. For everyone will say what is pleasing in his own eyes. And they will make of none effect the prophecy of the prophets which were before me. And these my visions also will they make of none effect in order to speak after the impulse of their own heart. So we see that happening, right? We see um, people confusing feelings for facts. 
We see a huge growth of narcissism, of antisocial behavior. I mean, even with this whole debacle with uh, smear campaigns on the Jesus strand, we're not seeing people actually debate the information from, coming from a place of reason and calmness, where they're giving their own research to counter things that we have found. Instead, they're coming with their emotion and name calling, which is impulse of their own heart. So there we go. Isaiah is saying it right here. So chapter four. And now Hezekiah and Josab, my son, these are the days of the completion of the world. So the end of time. And we talked about this last week. Okay. So when we talk about the completion of the world, we're talking about the end of a specific contract that Lucifer had with God. We see this contract in the canonized Bible as well as the missing books of the Bible. So I've said this before, I'll say it again because repetition is how we kind of learn and understand. From my own understanding, from my readings of these missing books and my own critical thinking skills and logic, we know that when man fell from grace, so whether you believe that was a literal story of Adam and Eve eating from the tree of knowledge of good and evil, or if that's a metaphor of man's, it doesn't matter to me which one you believe, the outcome is still the same. When we had that consciousness, when we, we ate and we received that information to understand good and e evil, there are consequences of understanding. The more we understand something, the more we have to live through the understanding of that said thing. You can't know good, you can't know God, until you truly understand what evil is. And so when man decided to fall from grace and take that bite of that apple or grape or whatever it was, whatever happened, where we had all of a sudden the access to greater understanding, God made a deal with Lucifer, the fallen angel, that he would be able to rule this earth, this planet, for a certain amount of time. The fact that Lucifer was leading the charge on this planet for a certain amount of time gave us as men, as mortals, the opportunity to practice free will. I understand that one of the things said about the missing books of the Bible was that if God wanted there to, all these books of the Bible to be in the Bible, then they would be. Well, that logic isn't, in my opinion, isn't, isn't logic at all. Because if you believe that, if you believe that all the missing books in the Bible would be in the Bible, or all the books of the Bible were put in the Bible that God wanted in the Bible, by that logic, then you're also saying all these crimes against children that we know have happened, God wanted that too. You can't, you can't have it both ways. Like free will is free will. And God allowed man to be corruptible so that we would learn and grow and that we would understand the choices that we're making. I hope that makes sense. You know, I, I really hope that makes sense. The Bible is corrupt. It was corrupted by Constantine and changed three different times and books pulled out and buried. And if you carried some of these books back a long time ago, then you were could have been put to d-e-a-t-h for having these books um, not something jesus would have ever done so we have to understand that but at the completion of the world so as we start off chapter four this idea of the days of the completion of the world means the end of the contract with lucifer we call this in the bible the book of revelation uh the apocalypse the lifting of the veil so now god is Venging his, you know, he's putting his wrath out on these Satanists right now. They're the ones going through the tribulation because they chose by free will, they chose to participate in these services, in these rituals that we know they participate in. They made that choice. You don't accidentally show up at Bohem Bohemian Grove and accidentally end up participating in these, these services. No, that is an actual conscious choice that you have made and so now those days are over so i hope that makes sense all right so he's talking about basically our time now so let's go to verse two after it is consumed belier the great ruler the key so here we go again this is what i was just saying verse two after it was excuse me after it was consummated belier the great ruler the king of this world will descend who hath ruled it since it came into being, ye, he will descend from his firement in the likeness of man, a lawless king, the slayer of his mother, who he himself, even this king. So he's talking about the, he's talking about the Antichrist. Now, from what we understand, the Antichrist has already been taken out. So that's something we don't have to worry about. 
allegedly. Um, I don't really have an opinion on that. I know where my heart belongs, so I, I don't really have an opinion on the Antichrist at this point, but it's just very fascinating to hear some of these military insiders talk about that. It's super fascinating. We'll, uh, verse 3, will persecute the plant which the apostles of the beloved had planted. Of the apostles, one will be delivered into his hands. So one of that makes me believe that the Antichrist is coming through the church, basically, which I think we kind of we kind of know that. This ruler is the form of a king that will come, and there will there will come, and there will come with him the powers of this world, and they will hearken unto him and all that he desires. And at his word, the sun will rise at night, and he will make the moon to appear at the sixth hour. And all that he hath desired, he will do in the world. He will do and speak like the beloved, and he will say, I am God, before me there will be none. You know, it's interesting because we know a lot now about the moon and the sun, and we're starting to figure out that we don't really know a whole lot about outer space because what we've been told is a load of BS, so it's all bunk. So we're still starting trying to figure out like what the sun actually is, what the moon actually is, what are the planets actually. And a lot of people have now are starting to see two suns. Uh, and that's wild. It's wild. You can find pictures. Actually, last I checked, Google had not taken down these pictures yet. Yet of people posting two suns. Like, why are there two suns? And we know that this, um, you know, these, this group of people, uh, you know, think about Mr. B-I-L-L-G-A-T-E-S and his, um, I'm trying to think how I can say this because of YouTube, the trails in the skies that are full of chemicals. You know, they're trying to block certain things out that we need here on this earth. So it's interesting he's talking about that. Now, I do have some information regarding something that happened at Notre Dame. I don't know if I can talk about it. I don't know if, cause when I heard that I was told over, told to me over a phone call. But I think Gene Decodes might have mentioned something about something that was going on at Notre Dame regarding the Antichrist, where they had taken, possibly, allegedly, maybe taken some of the uh, blood off of the um, crown of thorns that is supposed to be at Notre Dame and created a human body that from the DNA that resembles that of Jesus maybe and we're like going to do some ceremony but the white hats took it out anyway I don't know a whole lot about that and I don't know much further I can say about that but what I will say is it was taken care of so so you don't have to stretch you don't have to stress so anyway all right Verse 7, and all the people in the world will believe him, and they will sacrifice to him, and they will serve him, saying, This is the God, and beside him there are no other. And they, a great number of those who shall have been associated together in order to receive the beloved, he will turn aside after him. And there will be the power of miracles in every city and region, and he will set up his image before him in every city. Okay, this is super interesting, and I'm just going to say this. Like, we've talked about... Um, before the you know the, the pictures that almost every church regardless of whether you're a protestant a catholic a jehovah's witness a mormon whatever any type of flavor of christianity in their churches has pretty much the same picture of jesus and we know that that's not jesus that's cesare borgia cesare borgia was an actual person who lived he was one of the illegitimate sons of one of the popes the borgias were very 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 scandalous family i think showtime did a whole series on the borgias and if your family is – there's enough there for Showtime or HBO to create a whole series over your family, you know you come from a pretty screwed up family because, man, they were very corrupt, the Borgias. Well, the legend goes, story goes, that Cesare Borgia was in a relationship with Da Vinci. And Da Vinci painted his portrait, and that was the portrait that we now pass around in churches and say is Jesus. Now, why would they do that? This goes back to Operation Bluebeam um, when it was first set up. They were going to put a hologram in the sky of Jesus coming down, which would be their their kind of their Antichrist, right? Which kind of goes back to the whole thing I was saying about thing at Notre Dame with the DNA and all that kind of stuff. They were going to try to make it look like their version of Jesus so that we would have been indoctrinated through this seeing this picture everywhere that that's what Jesus looked like. Um, and so it's interesting that he said he will set up his image before him in every city because we know that the dark arts have actually done that. That has actually happened. This is long after Isaiah lived that Cesare Borgia was around. All right. Verse 12, and he shall bear sway three years and seven months and 27 days. And many believers and saints, having seen him, 
for whom they are hoping, who was crucified, Jesus the Lord Christ. After that, Isaiah had seen him, who was crucified and ascended. And those who were believers in him, of these few in those days, will be left as his servants while they flee from desert to desert, awaiting the coming of the beloved. So people would know that that wasn't the real guys, basically what they were saying. And look at that. Look, here we are. We, we know. We're on to you. We actually understand what's going on, you know? But we know there are a lot of Christians out there that don't understand what's going on. We know there are a lot of Christians out there that are getting the cure right now. And the cure, hello, like you don't need to be a genius to know that the, the cure that's out there, quote unquote, the cure, um, has every single thing about the mark of the beast. It's, it's like prophecy is playing itself out. So, all right, verse 14. And after 1,332 days, the Lord will come, his angels, and with their armies of the holy ones from the seventh heaven with glory of the seventh heaven. And he will drag Beliar into Jehana and also his armies. We talked about Jehana last week. It's kind of like a holding cell for bad people. Um, and he will give the rest of the godly whom he shall find in one body in this world. And the sum, and the son will be, excuse me, and the and the son will be ashamed. So, yeah, we know that people who are duped right now and are following the, you know, the um, illness that they have put out that we know is actually doesn't, isn't even something that stands on its own. It's not even real. Um, it's, you know, it's not what they're saying it is. Those people that are kind of following that fake illusionary uh, delusional narrative, um, we know, we've been told that once everything comes out that they're going to be very ashamed that they actually fell for this. So it's interesting that it's, it's, it's saying that right here in the Ascension of Isaiah. And to all, because of their faith in him, have execrated Belier and his kings, but the saints will come with the Lord with their garments, which are now stored up on the high in the seventh heaven. With the Lord they will come, whose spirits are clothed. They will descend and be present in the world, and he will strengthen those who have been found in the body together with the saints, with the garments of the saints. And the Lord will minister to those who have kept watch in this world. And afterwards they will turn themselves upward in their garments, and their body will be left in the world." And there, so, okay, that's that's the rapture, right? And we've talked about the rapture, that the rapture, we're not going to freaking float up in the sky. A spaceship is not going to come pick us up. Like, that's not the rapture. If you understand what's going on right now, if you're awake, if you've been quote-unquote red-pilled, then congratulations, you've been raptured. You know, you understand what's actually going on, where maybe your best friend or your husband or your wife or your family doesn't still believe the BS that is in the illusionary word of the world of the matrix. So, all right, verse 18. Then the boy, voice of the beloved will in wrath rebuke the things of heaven and things of earth and the things of earth and the mountains and the hills and the cities and the deserts and the forest and the angels of the sun and that of the moon and all the things wherein Beliar manifested himself and acted openly in his world. And there will be a resurrection and a judgment in their midst in those days, aka tribunals. We know they're happening, military tribunals, and the beloved will cause fire to go forth from him, and it will consume all the godless, and they will be thought they had not, and it will be as though they had not been created. So fire, it's interesting you talk about fire, because fire is something that's spoken a lot about in yoga, and I know um, Chantel over on Aquarius Rising, we've talked about the, the Agni, the, or the Agni, the fire, the God said that will be light, divine light. Fire is actually very purifying. That's why in traditional yoga, you're supposed to sweat a lot. Not like hot yoga. Hot yoga is not traditional yoga. I'm talking about actual, you creating your own body heat through exercise and action, as Cindy said, that shakti of work, right? Because that fire is what purifies things, not just the body, but it can also purify the mind. That's We talked about fevers. Like sometimes when you get a fever, it's your body upgrading itself. If you missed that video, I will also link that video down in the description box below. And the rest of the words of the vision is written in the vision of Babylon. And the rest of the vision regarding the Lord, behold, it is written in three parables according to my word, which are written in the book, which I publicly prophesized. And the descent of the beloved into Sheol, which is hell, behold, it is written in the section and where the Lord says, Behold, my son will understand. And all these things, behold, they are written in the Psalms, in the parables of David, the son of Jesse, and the Proverbs of Solomon, his son, in the words of Korah, and Ethan the Israelite, in the words of Aspha, and in the rest of the Psalms, which the angel of the Spirit inspired. 
Okay, so some of those people, I don't know who they are. I don't know who Ethan the Israelite is, or Korah, or Asfa. And I think we said this last week, you know, there are 711 books that are missing from the Bible. We only have, a, out of all those 711 books, we've only found about 45 of them. So, and some of those books, as you know, are not complete because the pages were deteriorated, all that kind of stuff. So if you think about that, there are so many books that we have not, been privy to, there are probably countless people and characters from the Old Testament and the New Testament that were prominent prophets that we just have no idea who they are because we weren't given that information. So, I, I, you know, the fact that there are some names here that I don't know doesn't surprise me. Anyway, all right. Verse 22, namely in those which have not the name written and in the words of, of my father Amos and Hosea the prophet and Micah and Joel and Nanhun and Jonah and Obadiah and Habuk and Haggai and Malachi and in the words of Joseph the just and in the words of Daniel. So this brings us to chapter 5. On account of these visions, therefore, Balier was wroth with Isaiah and he dwelt in the heart of Manasseh and he sowed him in sunder with a wooden saw. So again, we talked about that last week. You can kind of cross-reference this to a verse in Hebrews about how Isaiah passed. And when Isaiah was being sown in sunder, Belcheria stood up, accusing him, and all the pro false prophets stood up, laughing and rejoicing because of Isaiah. And Belcheria, with the aid of Mech and Bechus, I don't know who that is, that's M-E-C-H-E-M-B-E-C-H-U-S, stood up beside, stood up before Isaiah, excuse me, laughing, deriding. And Belchera said to Isaiah, say I have lived in, in all, and I have spoken, and likewise the ways of Manasseh are good and right. And the ways also Belcheria of his associates are good. And this he said to him when he began to sow in sunder. But Isaiah was, was absorbed in the vision of the Lord, and through his eyes were open, he saw them not. And Belcheria spoke thus to Isaiah, Say what I say unto thee, and I will turn their hearts, and I will compel Manasseh and the prince of Judah and the people in all Jerusalem to reverence thee. So this is interesting, okay, guys? So this is, again, we're kind of seeing this paralleled here today. So Manasseh, um, excuse me, Isaiah is going through probably one of the most horrific um, things to experience, uh, the way that he is being removed from the earth plane. Uh, I love I love the words that Janine picks because of the other words are censored. So he's being removed from the earth plane right now against his will in a very horrific way. He's being cut in two. And there, these people, these false prophets, while this torture is happening, they're saying to him, if you just basically say that we're good, the good guys, and Manasseh is the good guys, and what we're doing are good, we'll stop this from happening, and we'll have people actually respect you. Now, even though we're not going through the same type of pain as Isaiah here, we've kind of seen that in our own lives. Like, if, if you just put that thing over your mouth, like, I can't, I don't know if I can say it on YouTube, but you know what I'm talking about, and just live, just do it, just go along with it, then everything will be okay. But here we have Isaiah He's actually seeing a vision of the Lord while this is happening to him, so he's able to kind of focus on God and, and not pay attention to everything else going on around him, which I think a lot of us have had to do um, in our own ways, is just keep our eye on the prize, right? Focus on the good, focus on the right, the just, while going through hell and back, basically. So that brings us to verse 9, And Isaiah answered and said, So far I have utterance, I say, Damned and accused be thou in thy powers and all thy house. So he's basically saying, F you, putting the little finger up at them. For thou canst not take from me aught save the skin of my body. And they seized and sawed and sunder Isaiah the son of Amos with a wooden saw, and Manasseh and Belchiri and the false prophets and the prince and the people, and all stood looking on. And the prophets who were with them, he said, before he had been sown in sunder, go ye to the region of Tyre and Sidon, for me only hath God mingled the cup. And when Isaiah was being sown in sunder, he neither cried aloud nor wept, but his lips spake with the Holy Spirit until he saw in twain. This Belier did to Isaiah through Belchura and Manasseh, for Samael was very wrathful against Isaiah from the days of Hezekiah, king of Judah, on account of the things that he had seen regarding the beloved. And on account of the destruction of Samael, which he had seen through the Lord, while Hezekiah, his father, was still king, and he did according to the will of Satan." So this brings us to chapter 6. This is the last chapter that we're going to read today. 
The vision which Isaiah the son of Amos saw in the twentieth year of the reign of Hezekiah, king of Judah, came Isaiah the son of Amos and Josab the son of Isaiah to Hezekiah to Jerusalem from Galgala. And having entered, he sat down on the couch of the king, and they brought him a seat, but he would not sit thereon. When Isaiah began to speak the words of faith and truth with King Hezekiah, all the princes of Israel were seated, and the eunuchs and the counselors of kings, and there were forty prophets and sons of the prophets. They all had come from villages and from mountains and the plains when they had heard that Isaiah was coming from Galga to Hezekiah. And they had come to salute him and to hear his words and that he might place his hands upon them, and that they might prophesy, and then might, that he might hear the prophecies. And they were all before Isaiah. And when Isaiah was speaking to Hezekiah the words of truth and faith, they all heard a door which one had opened in the voice of the Holy Spirit. And the king summoned all the prophets and all the people who were found there. And they came. And Micaiah and the aged Ananias and, jo and Joel and Joseph sat on his right and on the left. And it came to pass, when they had all heard the voice of the Holy Spirit, they all worshipped on their knees and glorified the God of truth, the Most High, who is in the upper world and who sits on the high and holy one and who rests among his holy ones. And they gave glory to him who had thus bestowed a door in an alien world that bestowed it to a man. And he was speaking in the Holy Spirit in the hearing of all. He became silent and his mind was taken up from him and he saw not the men that stood before him. Through his eyes indeed were open, moreover his lips were silent, and the mind in his body was taken up from him. But his breath was in him, for he was seeing a vision. And the angel who had sent to make him see was not of this fire firmament, nor was he the angel of glory of this world, but he had come from the seventh heaven. And the people who stood near did not think, but the circle of the prophets did, and the holy Isaiah had been taken up. And the vision which the holy Isaiah saw was not from this world, but from the world which is hidden from the flesh. And after Isaiah had seen this vision, he narrated it to Hezekiah and to Josab his son, and to the other prophets who had come. But the leaders and the eunuchs and the people did not hear, but only Samah the scribe and Ijogan, that's I-J-O-A-Q-E-M, I have no idea how to say that, and asked Father Recorder, for these also were doers of righteousness, and the sweet smell of the Spirit was upon them. But the people who had not heard, for Micaiah and Joseph his son, had caused them to go forth, when the wisdom of this world had been taken from him, and he had become as one dead. All right, so that ends chapter six. We will pick up next week with chapter seven. Again, thank you so much, guys, for all of your support. I appreciate every single one of you. I love every single one of you. We are gonna get through everything that's been put before us. We were all put here for a reason at this moment to help make this world a better place. I love each and every one of you guys. Hold the line, the best is yet to come. Thank you again to Josh McKay for doing the music for this channel. If you would like to purchase the full song, there's a link again down in the description box for that. And thank you to Todd for helping me get this video out to you all. I hope you guys have a wonderful day, and I'll talk to you all soon. Bye.